I think I need to start by saying just to say that I'm, I am deeply suspicious and mistrustful of the term multimedia. And you know, I think as Piotr was sort of saying, I think it's, it's a term which perhaps is kind of losing meaning today and it's, it's always been around, but there are kind of very new and different ways of kind of getting it out of distribution. And I also want to say thank you so much for that really interesting talk and I found it uh, really your insights were, were, were great. I mean, I'm at the moment, I feel myself in a bit of a fog of trying to understand what's going on around us. I think we're in the middle of a kind of huge technical industrial revolution. You know, the, the continents of film and photography colliding, and there's a kind of a mist all around us. And I'm, I'm, I'm really struggling to find my own route and also kind of understand the world we're in and you know, where it goes and where, and where I place myself within that. And as Jenny said, you know, I'm, I'm not remotely someone who's technically sophisticated. You know, I, I've I think I've managed to send six tweets to my long-suffering followers, and I haven't really worked on how to deal with Facebook. You know, and I know I, I need to take this all on, and I need to, you know, do it in a big way. I mean, I, on the other hand, I am very excited, and I have been very excited by what the internet and multimedia can bring. Um, in 2003, um, when I when I sort of made a connection with Corbus, at that point Brian Storm, who was directing the, the, the Corbus photographic section encouraged me to start doing multimedia. And he actually gave me, I was off to South Africa at that point to do a project on HIV medication and the meaning of um, living with and without treatment. And Brian encouraged me to take on a sound recorder and start doing multimedia. So I was kind of kicked off in that direction. But there's a longer story. And I'm going to start with my work as a photographer. I've been trying to photograph the issue of HIV in Africa for, HIV in Africa for about nearly 19 years now. Um, and I'm going to quickly run you through some of my photographs. Um, I'm not going to have a lot of time to dwell, but in terms of multimedia, I began, and I'm not sure how much, you, to what extent you guys are familiar with, some of the difficult issues about photographing AIDS. And the fact that photographers like me could easily be accused of being what were called victimologists, people portraying people living with AIDS as pathetic, powerless victims. Um, and that's a very well-known picture. I, took of Joseph Gayle being carried out of his house by his mother, um, I began to find that in combining words and the actual quotes, and I, I had a little sign organizer in the you know, early 90s, and I began typing, talking to people, and just getting their words. Com combining people's words with their photographs, I found deepened the experience of the viewer, and in some ways it go, went against the whole ethic of kind of and this is my book, Broken Landscape, which is a kind of multimedia because it combines photographs and words um, and a sequence of photographs. And, and in, in this book, about, which was published in 1991 about HIV and AIDS in Africa, I, um, I, I want it to be a photographic book but and a reading book. And it's a book which you can read like a normal book with a lot of words from people and there's a real narrative sequence in the stories. And, it felt appropriate for the subject that it wasn't just a display of my photography, it was about the words and the real experience of the people I was photographing. Um, so I'm going to quickly take you through. Um, and unfortunately, with Jenny giving me very strict directions about time, I haven't got a lot of time to talk about the photographs. So I'm going to just quickly give you a sense of the kind of photography I was doing um, in that period. And, and I mean, this again is a very, was a very important picture where I was present when someone died from kidney failure while I was photographing. And as a moment for me, I, I actually stopped photographing when, when this happened. I, before, when I realized what was going on, Dr. Ashwanda, the Swiss doctor on the right, when I put my camera down, he looked at me for a moment and said, come on then, do your job. And you know, I didn't have any other role there besides being a photographer. And I think one had to have a sense of, if you're going to put yourself in that position, you had to speed yourself and keep on working and telling stories. Um, and, um, that's a, a funeral visual. In Uganda, this is some work I did on, on a home care project. And this is just a selection of images. This um, Florence in Uganda was living with HIV and AIDS and telling her story. And I've done increasingly began doing a lot of work with people who are positive, advocate telling their stories. This is the Reverend Gideon Biomogisha, who's an openly positive priest in Uganda who has become a friend. We share a name and we're also twins because we are born on the same day in the same year. Um, and from the 
2000, 2001, my engagement with the story changed. And I, I suppose I became more of an activist than a photographer. And this is a picture taken at the Breaking the Silence AIDS conference in the year 2000. And for me, it was a, kind of, maybe this is a transition point where I began engaging with the organization Treatment Action Campaign. Because I felt it was just really important to try to fight for the right kind of treatment to be available to, to people in Africa. Um, Okay, this, um, <laughs> okay, um, multimedia. Yeah. Multimedia, okay, so multimedia, multimedia coming in all different kinds of ways. This is a 360 panoramic picture which I did in the offices of, of, of the Treatment Action Campaign in, in South Africa. And tomorrow at my um, expert meeting, um, I'm going to be talking about the um, through Positive Eyes Project, and there's, there's an interesting connection because one of the people in this picture, but I photographed in 2003 for this over here. Oh, sorry, excuse my technical incompetence. Um, Gugu actually featured again, and she was part of she's, she's part of that project. Um, and I began developing different, perhaps more conceptual ways of dealing with it. This is you know ways of telling stories and developing the idea of a frame, which people could put whatever they wanted to into a frame. And this is another panoramic of all the orphans and vulnerable children in a village in Burkina Faso. And some work on the idea of memory, memory boxes and the psychological implications of HIV and AIDS for orphans. Um, an orphan-headed household. Um, a family of orphans walking home from school. And it speaks for itself. Um, it's outside a hospital with carers, guardians in, in Malawi. It's a TV ward in Malawi. And this is a body of work which I did in a place called Lusiki Siki. It was actually initially an assignment for National Geographic, which I developed further myself, of following the stories of people who um, were starting treatment. This was a 15-year-old girl, Nozambila, in Dara, um, sorry, Nomfuma, Nomfuma Neko Yako, who unfortunately died. The treatment didn't work, and she died a few weeks after I took this picture. Um, and this is a very important story. This is Nongpilo Mazuza, who, when I took that picture, she had a CD4 count of seven, which means she had almost no immune system. She was a very ill person with both HIV and multi-drug resistant AIDS. And that's, in a way, a classic example of what I could have been accused of, of being a victimologist in terms of photographing a person with AIDS as an emaciated victim. Um, and that's her two years later. And the treatments worked with her for children. Um, and I, I mean, there's a much longer photo essay, but as you can see, I'm, I'm very much a storytelling photographer. And this is um, Nozomila and Dara, also um, <coughs> shortly after the, the medication began to, to help and work with her. This is a kind of installation piece I did in the Siki Siki with NSF, and it, it's called 99 Faces, and those are all the faces of people in that community who were alive because of getting the right medication. Um, and this is from a body of work I did in Lesotho on the prevention of the transmission of, of HIV from, from mothers to their babies. And it was a mother who was taking the right medication, um, and that's so her, her baby being born. Um, and this is from a piece of work I did on the border of Zambia and Zimbabwe. And she's a HIV positive sex worker going out to work in the evening. Okay, moving on further to um, what I call a more collaborative approach. And part of the, what, you saw, what I've shown you is bringing people's words. And increasingly, I found it important to bring people's words. And recorded words, I began doing different kinds of things with, with sound and also with kind of, kind of video. Um, so I'll show you these three pieces. These, so, so these are much these are kind of collaborative images, which I developed, developed with with the people I was photographing. Um, okay, so that's David, and this is the, the video. Which I'll show you. This picture is about me. It has a meaning that uh, every individual in this country is HIV. So whether you're positive or negative, you have a role to play. The perception of a person who is HIV positive is that uh, he's a person that who, who needs to be assisted. That is a wrong perception. Because I can't live as well as a person who is a diabetic. I'm not living as well as a person who is with cancer. 
we need opportunities. And if we get those opportunities, we can. We're not a burden to any other person. We are doing performances to the community. At the end of the play, I come and give out my testimony. Ask me, I'm living with the HIV. When you come out and say I'm HIV positive, people are saying, What? I try to challenge them that what did you expect? Did you expect to get a thin person? Did you expect to get a person who is having sores? Fighting HIV is a combined work of the society. The society has a role to play to support these people who are HIV positive. I'm putting my goals higher, my aspiration higher, because being HIV positive does not mean the end of life. I normally live in Nairobi. Many doctors used to tell me to go for HIV test, but I used to, to deny because I used to say that thing belonged to prostitutes. I was totally sick. I went to the weight of 20 kgs. I was tested, I was found I'm positive. My in-laws, the moment they knew I am positive, surely they hated me. When my husband was knocked down and killed, immediately the in-laws came and knocked down my houses and forced us to go. I have no any relative who is standing with me. They have gone just because of my status. Now I'm in Nairobi, being desperate with my four children inside this wretched house full of rats. Many times my children cry aloud, oh mom, a rat is eating my leg. I just feel, yeah, this situation is so pathetic and weak. I feel it is not good to disclose my status. How can I portray my full image? Even in church, you cannot disclose. They don't have knowledge about this thing. The church segregates people. When they see someone with HIV, they see you are a prostitute. They see you that you are a sinner. I'm being encouraged and strengthened through the word. When they force me out, then I'll lose a lot. I normally hate myself. I feel God has done something bad to me. So my hope is to see my children get education. I don't know what a, a miracle God can do for my children to have a home. We have nothing. Just we are around here waiting for the Lord to come. And I don't know when he will come. Okay, so, um, showing you some of the, the various different kinds of kind of multimedia storytelling I've been doing around HIV. Um, I'll show you a bit of a film. I mean, this was very much commissioned by um, Columbia University, who wanted me to do a piece of work about their, um, what's called MTCP Plus, the enhanced program to help families um, with HIV. Hey, 
Tingalunga de mine beta, afe na wetala baba kenyita. Tingalunga la vazi ni mwe vale, afe na wetala baba kenyita. Ila tila de mine beta, afe na wetala baba kenyita. My name is Awo Ruth. I'm in primary six. My mother disclosed to me three years ago, and that time I was eight years old. She had to tell me that my dad died of HIV AIDS, and I was also infected. We are the young positive generation. Oh, 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 young positive generation. Oh, we are the young positive generation. Oh, 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 young positive generation. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I used to ask mommy the reasons why I used to take drugs, yet I'm not sick. You had to say, Ruth, come and take your drugs. I told her, mommy, today I'm not taking the drugs before understanding my life status. Time came when she wanted to refuse taking the medicine, the counselors, and said, now you have to tell her the truth why she's taking the drugs. So one day I got her slowly. I told her that you have grown up without seeing your father. And your father died because of HIV positive. By the time I gave birth, the nurses checked and they found also HIV positive. That's why you see that we go all the time in the hospital for, to get treatment. She was so shocked and I also felt it. I saw that the girl changed the complete she felt like crying, so I had to get the ways of comforting her and pulling her back. I told her that, no, you don't get scared. You are going to be okay. I felt bad and I had to cry, but there was nothing to be done. So when she told me I continued taking my drugs and my life is okay, I'm healthy and I'm taking my drugs willingly and I want to thank her because she disclosed to me. Sometimes she used to fall sick and she was needing some help and maybe I thought that she could be sick when I'm not around. When the sisters they are aware about her status they can easily help her. So time came when I was forced to tell them. Ruth was eight years old when you knew that she was HIV positive. Sometimes we feel bad because my mother gives her more attention than us because for her she's HIV positive and us we are HIV negative. They give me much support and care. They make sure that I'm taking my drugs properly. When I forget, they try to remember me. I give talks in the public, like in conferences, communities, telling people about my life status and encouraging them to disclose to their children or partners. When they see like that daughter of mine sharing her life experience, they get courage of how to disclose to their children. Fellow countrymen, open your ears and listen. HIV is with us today. He's a very fierce and strong man. However, getting HIV is not the end of life. I'm going to move on to another area of engagement um, that happens with, with multimedia and, and what photography is. And I'll start with the photographic side. I, I've been wanting to uh, really engage kind of with telling kind of stories around the issue of climate change, which is a very difficult thing to image. Um, because often imaging climate change is sort of somewhere to court, gets caught somewhere between National Geographic and pretty pictures of polar bears and ice caps and kind of evidence. And so I began doing this body of work, which is in some ways non-journalistic, because it's very much about an engagement with the camera, what I call the accusing, the accusing glance or the accusing stare, and of landscapes and portraits of people in 
scenarios of flooding. So um, I'll take you through some, some of the images. And I also am quite perverse in some ways in this world today of kind of digital multimedia, is that doing this work on my really old, 50-year-old 50, 50 and Roddy Flex cameras on film. So this is a film project and you know, a very old, quite slow, kind of you know, difficult way of working technically. So these are some photographs from the floods in Bihar in India a couple of years ago. Moving on to the floods in the north of England. Moving on to the floods in Haiti. And brief this brief piece about this picture is one of my favourite images. Um, I struggled for this year. I struggled for three days to get into Gonaive, where, where, where the flooded town in Haiti. Um, when I got there, my um, battery charger for my backup Canon camera died, so my digital camera wasn't working. And I had two rolly flexes, and we'd waded up to this village. We'd gone you know, through about a kilometre of water to get to this village. With, you know, I'd gone with the villagers, and it rained, and the strap on my one rolly flex broke, and that camera fell in the water. And um, I had one other rolly flex, and I set it up, and, and my assistant, so-called assistant, knocked it over, knocked over the tripod. So I had two wet cameras, and um, no digital backup. And in, a, in this remarkable situation, you know, in this, with the villagers taken me out to show me their flooded village, um, and I, all I could do was try to dry out my rolly flex. So I opened them up, I dried them out as best I could, and I kind of kept on working. And um, when I first got the images back, they looked totally fucked. Because, you know, they were all, you know, because the, the, the water inside the cameras had, had this impact. Um, but, and also, actually, over the next two days, the cameras slowly rusted and stopped working. Um, <laughs> but um, actually, you know, that, that image for me is something, something quite remarkable because both the kind of the film and the person are kind of affected by, by, by the floodwaters, and it's kind of, I suppose, one of my all time favorite images. Um, so that's. Haiti as well, and you can see the strange colour, which was kind of a result of, of the kind of the, the, the steam inside the camera, which kept on changing depending on the amount of on the, on, on the kind of heat level. And this is kind of moving on to Pakistan. So, I, I, in, in, in the last two countries I've been to last year and this year, um, in Pakistan and um, you'll, you'll see coming up Australia. I began to shoot video as well. So at the same time, I mean, making my life very difficult, at the same time as shooting on these really old roddy flexes, I was also shooting, shooting video. So moving to Australia. <laughs> Um, so this is a PDF of what was about to be published, and they were also going to show my the video which I'm about to show you, which I, I I'm very proud of. And then unfortunately, they much more fortunate other people that the tsunami happened in Japan, and they obviously couldn't publish this a competing kind of watery <coughs> disaster, which wasn't nearly as bad. So it's just at the last minute, it got pulled from publication. Um, but let me show that this was also going to be launched as a, as a very big kind of deal the Guardian, um, as a, a, it, and, and it was published there, but not with the same kind of fanfare, which I think it would, it would have been. Um, so let me show you the, the video language.
Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Danielson. My mom is from Portugal and my father is from Angola. I photographed a lot of things. My sisters and family. And I photographed lots of things around Kingsmead Primary School. Hello, my name is Emma Tate and I was born in England and my mum and dad are from Jamaica. I photographed my sister and around the house. My favourite picture is the Smarty picture because I like eating Smarties. Hi, my name is Tremaine. I took a picture of the estate. I was seeing if I can find any people doing like what they do in their everyday life. My brother is quite happy. He's, he's laughing most of the time. Hi, my name is Gianni. I made lots of pictures around the school. And my mom comes from Cuba and my dad comes from Colombia. Hi, my name is Jordan. My parents come from Congo, but I was born in London. Some photos you can make when you, you, you don't know where you get them from, but you just take it and then it just looks amazing when you look at it. I took a picture of my mum talking on the phone. This is the poem I wrote about my photograph. Each part of the Congo is part of her body. Miss you at home. I miss you in Africa where it was so hot. That necklace you gave me is all I got. You told me to be brave from the necklace you gave. 
without you it's dark like a cold cave i will be brave that is true my words are coming from me to you i miss the air that i breathe in africa i pray to god to stop malaria i thank you for who you are you are the person that made me go far My name is Simon. This is a picture about my family. Some of them were taken in England and some of them were taken back in China. This picture is about my computer chair, which my brother usually rips. Those are my brother's medals. Some of my pictures were about Jamal and um, he was a f close friend of my brother. He was killed in May. He got stabbed in the middle of the night when he tried to stop a fight. He didn't get in trouble by the police. He was a very nice kid. Jamal Mason Blair had a very good conflict. He was a friend of mine but killed by a boy who committed a crime. He always has a ball to his feet. He went past the defenders with only the goalkeeper to beat. R.I.P. cause rest in paradise. Jamal was a loving blessed guy. Killed by a flip night. Grassed up by a banger jam. When are we gonna realize that carrying that makes it hard? Sh Hello, I am Sally. My parents are from Ghana and I was born in Homerton Hospital in Hackney, London. And I wanted to show people how I feel and how my life is. The pictures I took are around my family and my cousins. I was trying to see like how I would be able to make the picture look different and how to do it at different angles. This is my poem. It's about the photo of my cousin. It's been a long time since he heard his father's voice, but now it echoes down the ages. One son, one absent father, reunited again. My daddy's girl and them. He wakes up chop well and carries stuff about. Waiting for so long, dad going out to work, just waiting. Waiting for so long, dad can't be late, just waiting. Waiting for so long for some cash, just waiting. Star in my mum's room, practicing his look, performing his moves, practicing for fame in the summer heat, 
Rock in the bedroom, rock at night. Rock in the money, rock with me. Okay. Sorry for taking so long, Jenny. No. <laughs>